Hello, my name is Andrew Ahn Westover, and I am the Keith Herring Director of Education and Public Engagement at the New Museum. I join you today from the unceded land of Lenape people, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I am glad to welcome you to today's conversation between Theaster Gates and Massimiliano Gioni. Today launches a series of over a dozen artist conversations presented in conjunction with our current exhibition, Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America. Programs like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. I would particularly like to thank education and public engagement staff members, Andrea Calderes and Derek Wright, as well as the entire New Museum team for their help bringing this program together. New Museum digital initiatives are generously supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our members and supporters like you who help make these programs possible. I will now share brief biographical notes about this program's featured artist. Theaster Gates lives and works in Chicago. Gates creates works that engage with space theory and land development, sculpture and performance. Drawing on his interest and training in urban planning and preservation, Gates is known for his recirculation of art world capital. His work contends with the notion of black space as a formal exercise, one defined by collective desire, artistic agency, and the tactics of a pragmatist. In 2010, Gates created the Rebuild Foundation, a nonprofit platform for art, cultural development, and neighborhood transformation that supports artists and strengthens communities through free arts programming and innovative cultural amenities on on Chicago's South Side. Gates has exhibited and performed at Tate Liverpool, Haus de Kunst Munich, Walker Arts Center, Palais de Tokyo, Sprenker Museum Hanover, Kunstmuseum Basel, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, the Art Gallery of Ontario, Fondazione Prada, the Whitechapel Gallery, Punta della Dognana, and Documenta, he was the winner of the Arts Mundi Six Prize and a recipient of the Legion d'Honneur in 2017. In 2018, he was awarded the Nasher Prize for Sculpture and the Urban Land Institute J.C. Nichols Prize for Visionaries in Urban Development. Gates received the 2020 Crystal Award for his leadership in creating sustainable communities. Currently, Gates is a professor at the University of Chicago in the Department of Visual Arts and the Harris School of Public Policy and is a distinguished visiting artist and director of artist initiatives at the Lunder Institute for American Art at Colby College. Finally, I encourage you to learn more about upcoming public programs and our full suite of exclusive digital content on our website, newmuseum.org. Now, without further ado, I turn the conversation over to the New Museum's Edlis Neeson Artistic Director, Massimiliano Gioni. Thank you, Andrew, for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody and most uh, uh, dearly welcome to the Aster Gates, uh, who is joining us for the second time in, uh, in less than a week. So thank you so much really for your generous participation. It's a wonderful day in New York City. Uh, it's very sunny and a hint of spring. So I also want to thank all the people that are at home or on their phone watching us because they they're clearly losing out on a wonderful day, but so Tiaster, you have great competition from the Lord. <laughs> Thank you so let's much. <laughs> Thank you. So let's start. Uh, I, I want to start actually this conversation with the artist in Grief and Grievance uh, by asking them about their first meeting with Okuyen uh, who has been conceiving this exhibition, which was then completed by a, a team composed by Naomi Beck with Glenn Ligo, Mark Nash, and myself. So he asked, when did you meet Aukwe and how? Yeah, um, I believe I was in New York um, around 20, 2014. And uh, it, was, it was a chance meeting where I was with Thelma Golden and a few friends. And um, I was staying uh, in Midtown and I wanted to go have a steak at the Carlisle. And uh, Thelma was with her small team, it was Glenn Ligon, it was Oakwe, it was Morna. And, uh, and I felt like I had been invited into some kind of major, uh, you know, tribunal, you know, this, this group of uh, kind of art world intelligentsia. 
And I, I remember being extremely quiet uh, during this period and just kind of acting or, or I felt like a, a student listening to the, the annals of, of art and uh, the arguments of art and power. And it was, it was that night that's the strongest where Okwe and I had a, an exchange that was uh, significant. Uh, before then, I think we had just bumped into each other in passing. Um, and then very shortly after, uh, Okwe um, invited me to be a part of his uh, Biennale. And, and we'll talk about the, the Venice sure. Biennale, but I want to actually backtrack a little bit because a lot of your work has been uh, uh, rooted in Chicago and, uh, and, yeah. and particularly also very much connected to buildings and sites there. And Chicago was a, a, a place in the life of Okwi too. His yes. very first job in the States actually was as a joint curator at the Art Institute in Chicago. And uh, his uh, most famous uh, early exhibition to travel in the States was the Short Century, which opened at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago in 2002. So I want to ask you if you were aware of Okwi in Chicago and if you saw any of his shows, even though I don't know if the two of you overlapped uh, yep. when you were there. In fact, I was aware of his presence. Um, at the time, uh, I would have very comfortably called myself only a potter. Um, and I was interested in the craft community and uh, I was making, you know, tea bowls and, and uh, ceramic sculpture every day after work. Um, I was, uh, one of my earliest kind of connections to Oakwe was actually through a mutual friend, uh, Valerie Cassell Oliver. And it was Valerie who was a very dear friend and an early mentor as I came to understand myself, um, not only as a craftsman, but as a, as a maker uh, and a contemporary artist. It was Valerie who, you know, I can remember conversations on our couch, just talking about the histories of contemporary art and the, and the roles, not only that black people play, but like, you know, sculptors worldwide. And she was a great ally. And then she would also tell me stories of, of Okui. And, um, and at that point, he was just kind of a kind of larger, larger than life figure um, that, that loomed very uh, evidently in, in the city of Chicago. Um, while I didn't get to see a short century uh, I've been really conscious of that exhibition. It feels like it's still a part of my um, uh, insights, even though I, I didn't see it at the MCA. But I think it was, it was uh, uh, Valerie's uh, real uh, respect for and admiration of Oakley that, that, that first made me aware of, of his contributions, not only to art, but like the way he was as a human. I, I, since you mentioned Valerie, I do want to thank her publicly because it was through her help and generosity that we were be, we were able to um, create an exhibition copy of the wonderful piece, a small band, uh, which was on the facade of the central pavilion at the Venice Biennale uh, in Oquis edition, and which is now on the facade of the new museum. It's a, a wonderful piece by Glenn Ligon, which was acquired by Valerie and the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and, and so generously they let us uh, create this special exhibition version for uh, for grief and grievance according to to to, to fulfill the wish of Oakley. Um, we were talking about Chicago and your piece in in grief and grievance is uh, um, centered on a site that is been very important for you for your work, uh, which is uh, the, the piece it's titled uh, "Gone Are the Days of Shelter and Martyr." and it's shot in a church uh, on the eve of its destruction. And uh, I think we could start maybe from, from that piece and how it relates to your own career and, and also to your relationship with Oakley. And maybe uh, we can have an image of, of the piece. Sure. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, Massimiliano, because um, I can remember uh, when I was studying and when I was just starting to teach, uh, uh, I, I was reading like Miwan Kwan and, and thinking a lot about Lefebvre and, and, and trying to take some of these theoretical ideas about um, concrete space and abstract space and apply them to the truth of my living, you know? Um, I thought, uh, you know, 
people have very specific ideas about what it means to do site specific work. Um, but, but when I saw this building come down, none of those theoretical approaches felt necessary for me. It was like, I knew that this building was important. It had been an important part of, uh, of the architecture of the city, of, of this, this part of the South Side. And lots of people, uh, when it was coming down, lots of people who still lived in the neighborhood uh, were sad at the fact that you know the church and the school were, were places where they learned to be themselves and got an education and, and felt like they learned the rules of life. And so um, I decided that I would uh, try to um, expand this idea of site specificity. And instead of making permanent visual work, that it seemed that the monks performing a last sermon in the space would be uh, the most ideal response to the fact that it is quickly going away. And as you can see uh, uh, in, in the upper part of the photograph, uh, there is uh, an image of the Last Supper. Uh, and, and, um, and so the monks were able to kind of use this uh, site and iconography to deliver a kind of last sermon, uh, asking the building and asking God, if, if God is God, could you, uh, redeem this building and restore this building? Um, could you rebuild these walls? Could you rebuild this temple? And ultimately resolving at um, our engagement in the temple and our carrying that energy in us was the reconstruction of the temple. And so it, it, it ended up being a really um, pivotal uh, performance piece for me because there was no audience. There were just construction workers working, but it wasn't about the audience in this case, it really was about the site. There was no, you know, we had about an hour and a half to all get together, grab our camera guy, get our things together in the space, and then, you know, carefully walk over debris. And so it's a, it's a work that I feel very, very strongly about. And were you trying also to physically preserve, not in the performance, but I mean, in, in the process leading up to the performance, had you attempted to uh, preserve the, the church as a, um, as a presence in the neighborhood or even as a, let's say, as a sculpture. And Yes. So years prior, um, we had tried to reach out to the archdiocese to acquire the, um, the rectory, which was um, incredibly beautiful, uh, intact, with just one uh, priest, one parishioner there. Um, and uh, the, the church was maybe too big of a lift for me at the time. It probably still is, but I was really invested in, in trying to get it. And once the demolition company started working, um, we then asked them if we could um, create a partnership where we acquire the bricks that were being torn down. And that became a kind of workforce training program. We reached out to some local uh, uh, laborers who were interested in that kind of work. And they uh, extremely diligently salvaged as many bricks as we could. I think we had over 400 pallets of bricks from St. Lawrence. We ended up with the St. Lawrence statue, uh, which we'll see in a little bit, um, a marble altar, wooden trusts. We really tried to, as much as we could move down the street to my studio, um, we entered this partnership and it, and it, it remained uh, the, the materials, the remnants of the church remain in play even now. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned earlier that you were a potter or that you were more in the, let's say, craft um, context, but you also worked as a urban planner and you worked also <clears throat> as a consultant for um, cities on the placement of public artworks. And so I want to ask you, in relation to this piece and more broadly your work in the South Side, if you can tell us a little bit more how it developed, how and when you transition from being, you know, on the side, let's say, of urban planning and, and, and then thinking of what you were doing more as art and, and even uh, what that really mean for you and what it means for you today. Sure. Well, um, so I, I studied urban planning. It's true, and, and uh, a big part of what I was interested in uh, was land use and how land, land use law and the, 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 
the administration that governs land use in cities, how those things are made. And, and what you learn pretty quickly is that while it's government legislation, often it's, it's, a, it's a combination of developers will, the private communities will, and people who have big and good ideas and have resources that determine ultimately what's written about the way land is used. It's, it's not a divine order. It's, it's uh, filled with bias and, uh, and, 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 and predetermined ideas about who deserves what. And when I, when I was that close to it um, uh, with the Chicago Transit Authority and, and also just doing some, some work with other cities, I realized that maybe I could be more useful um, outside of the profession uh, than inside. But I was at the, the Chicago Transit Authority from about 2000 to 2006, 2006 or seven. And I learned a tremendous amount under, under the administration of Valerie Jarrett, working directly with a woman named Beth White. And, and that time was a time where I felt like my brain was shaped. I, I understood how big projects got done. I was an advocate for other uh, uh, artists to be able to do their work uh, in public space. But it also meant that I was like managing budgets and uh, negotiating with uh, large administrations. And, and I always say that this work that I did at the Chicago Transit Authority, it was really the most formulative work, um, like being an administrator, being a, a bureaucrat within government taught me so much about how administration works. And, and I wanted to uh, find ways as a private citizen to, to do more direct work than I could do at the Transit Authority. And so um, it, it was around 2007 that I decided that I would um, really focus on the neighborhood and the block that I lived on. It was a very modest uh, uh, set of ideas that I would just try to stabilize my block. And over time, it just kept growing um, to become more of an ideology than it is about constructing or deconstructing. <laughs> We can see some images of, of the presentation in um, in Venice. And yes. Sorry, I. That's great. So this is the church. That was the church as it had been was being torn down. Yeah. And then this is the the work which was ultimately the film Gone Other Days. Um, this slate work uh, from the roof, and then the bell that had told you know, for about a uh, hundred years. And then there were other elements, yeah, which we can see here. Yep, these are fragments from the pipe organ and we were able to get a small wind machine um, to activate the pipes um, that they might blow uh, uh, and play Amazing Grace. And then in the, in the far left, you see St. Lawrence in his original state which was a um, uh, concrete cast over, over a metal armature. And as you mentioned, you, I don't know if it's the same sculpture then that you also preserved and presented in a different iteration. And is that common that, that elements in your work uh, continue, let's say, migrating into other projects? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember reading a biography of Rauschenberg you know, and, and um, just kind of thinking about how there would be moments where he would, in his combines, recombine things. And uh, in St. Lawrence, once we took him from the church, I imagined him to be like an itinerant martyr uh, in search of a home. And so it was my hope to kind of keep St. St. Lawrence in activation until uh, he, he received a final home, which was at the Walker Art Center mm -hmm. uh, three years later. And we can see the picture of the... Yeah. And yeah, we'll we could go... Uh, St. Lawrence, I don't remember. Is the patron saint of... Uh, do you remember uh, who? Yes, he's the patron saint of, of bakers and mm -hmm. librarians. 
Um, he, uh, he was killed because he was such an advocate for the poor and, um, and uh, because he was such an avid reader and writer, um, you know, he, he became the patron saint of librarians. And I think maybe in some way he was guiding my own interest in, in large book collections. Does yeah. the title Gone Are the Days uh, refer to, to any uh, quote from the gospel or? No, it, it was more just kind of a reflection mass on the, on the, on the disappearance of architecture. And in this case, the, uh, the significant role that the archdiocese played in real estate. Uh, mm -hmm. not only in Chicago, but in lots of places, and in the most ambitious uh, architectural works of cities. I mean, the, the archdiocese was, was an institution that built large infrastructure for mm -hmm. its, its patrons. And over the years, as, um, as, as the Catholic church has lost attendance uh, from those early years, uh, it's meant that they've had to make major decisions about what to do with their, their structures and the, the desacralization of the structures and then ultimately selling them has been the only way that they could like keep the structures uh, in activation or make something good happen with the land. And so I think I was, I was um, mourning the loss of these beautiful buildings while at the same time acknowledging that the spiritual presence that had been in this part of town at least uh, was was uh, going away. And so, tell us a little bit about the project in in Minneapolis, and then I want to ask you a little more about uh, sure. another large international show. So maybe we can go back to the image of the structure. So, mm -hmm. uh, did you use here? You didn't use bricks from the actual church for this. No, in fact, uh, uh, so I, I had started developing a brick fetish uh, because I felt like brick was such an interesting uh, confluence of my interest in clay and my interest in architecture. It was, it was the modular unit. And I had started really investing in kind of uh, brick risk research. And I wanted to create a, a brick that would allow me to make a round. And so when I was invited by um, uh, Fionn uh, from the Walker Art Center, uh, to consider doing a public artwork, um, I was going to be sandwiched between Sol LeWitt and uh, Joseph Boys. And, and those two uh, artists were, were very significant to me and uh, especially Joseph Boys um, in the formation of my own artistic practice. Um, and I, I wanted to create a, a, a structure, um, not a, not a, not a not a monument object, but more like a structure that would allow me to be in conversation with Sol LeWitt's uh, cinder block work. And so that would give me the architectural piece. And then um, uh, boys had a tree planted and it would, it would allow me to kind of take the relational aspects of my practice and, and maybe expose it. And so in this case, creating a permanent home uh, for uh, St. Lawrence felt like a really uh, great uh, completion that I could like build a new temple for St. Lawrence. And then St. Lawrence would then kind of bless the grounds of the Walker Art Center, um, mm -hmm. which felt very exciting. And so I partnered with an architecture firm in Chicago called Muller and & Muller. And, um, and then I, I partnered with a brick manufacturer, uh, Green, Green uh, I'm sorry, Red Brick, in North Carolina. And we were able to create both a convex and a concave brick um, that ultimately created this, this structure, which I, which I love very much. <laughs> <laughs> and it's open, like the public can go inside or it's occasionally open or how does it's, it work? It's always open, at the, the park never closes, but on occasion for major holidays, there is a steel door structure inside that allows them to, to lock it Mm -hmm. um, and, but this was the kind of first major pavilion that I've done and uh, a, a building that was not made for people to dwell in, but, but for, for people to enjoy. I have a feeling, well, I've been told that uh, people in uh, Minneapolis really enjoy having private moments in the, in the pavilion. And really that's all I can hope for. <laughs> you, you mentioned Joseph Boyce as a, 
you know, a, a pretty large neighbor to have. And uh, I want to ask you about Documenta. Um, Documenta, which number was it for you? 13? 12. 12. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, which was a, a oh, no no documented 13. <laughs> 13 12 was uh, yeah uh, so documenta 13 which was a, a major break i think in your international reputation he followed the the whitney biennial in 2010 that i want to mention because it was curated by uh, my friends and colleagues francesco bonami and gary carrion murayari of the new museum gary so uh Absolutely. and it's great that they worked uh, uh, with you on that occasion, but I want to ask you about Documenta and Castle because also there was another site uh, very crucial in the life of Oak. We, you didn't exhibit in, in uh, Oakwood's Documenta that was in 2002. You would have been a baby <laughs> back then. But um, I want to ask you uh, first to tell us um, uh, something about that project in Documenta, how we evolved, how we related to your work in Chicago, and also um, about ideas around international art and culture uh, that are encapsulated in Documenta and if and how they shaped your ideas for that project. And, and if you also, you were somehow uh, in indirect conversation with Oquist Documenta when you were working on yours. Yeah. Well, if, if, if I were to try to give this justice or do this justice, and I, I haven't really talked about Documenta uh, very much um, publicly, but it's really important to understand the context at which I was working in 2011, 2010. Um, I really, at that point, uh, I didn't really call myself an artist yet. I thought I'm a, I'm a maker, I'm a, I'm a creative guy, I, I'm trained as a potter, uh, I love being a potter, and then I have these ideas about how the world should work. And, um, and I think that Francesco saw that and, and invited me to be in, the, in the, Whitney Biennale, the Whitney Biennial. But I think that when I met uh, uh, Carolyn in 2011, um, I met her two days after my mom had passed. And uh, I didn't really have an appetite to talk about being in a, in a major exhibition even though an opportunity like this I understood was very, very important. But as I said in our conversation last week, um, it, is, it was difficult to think about the title of um, the new museum exhibition without thinking about Oakwee's mortality. And because many of us went to visit Oakwee um, just before his passing, to see him still working in bed, still telling stories. He was still giving me advice on my Haus der Kunst exhibition and identifying um, key West African tribes who had a similar spiritual semantics as the work that I was trying to understand myself to build. I, I mean, he just had a completely different frame of reference for the things that I was doing. And so I think in this way, um, uh, the both my willingness to participate in grief and grievance is a kind of paying tribute. Documenta was a paying tribute. Um, and then the black monks in a way is, is a tribute to the history of gospel music, but also slave songs and work songs, the blues. And it, it's a demonstrated uh, um, commitment to, to, that I have to music. And, in, and, and to be specific gospel music. Um, and so I, I just think that I wouldn't have had the courage to be as explicit um, or to not make my, my investment in music like a, a pun or agnostic or denigrate its potency anyway. I knew that it wasn't entertainment, but I did know that it would happen for publics and um, when Oakley allowed the monks to then be present um, at his Biennale, that was a very, very important moment for me and, and I think for the black monks. And uh, what did you show at the House der Kunst? I don't remember if we have images actually, but, uh, and, um, and did the show open after Oakley's passing then or? Yep, uh, the, the work, the piece was called Black Chapel. 
-hmm. And it was, it was really like me conflating my South side experience with um, a collection that I, I recently uh, received of Jesse Owens, the famous uh, African-American runner. It was his album collection. So this was the third album collection that I had. And in a way it was Jesse Owens most complete corpus codex. And so I shipped the albums there and the, the atrium commission essentially became a way of contending with Hitler's ghost. Mm -hmm. And to be present in a room where uh, Hitler gave uh, key uh, talks on, on, on the future of, let's say, social bureaucracy, uh, you know, his attempts to carry out a, a pretty ambitious um, annihilation. Um, and much of that work happened in Munich. Um, which, which Hitler declared a kind of secondary cap, uh, capital. And so I wanted to, to fill that atrium with um, good energy, <laughs> let's say. And, um, and so Black Chapel was a way of um, acknowledging Jesse Owens's um, uh, three or four gold medals at the 1936 uh, uh, Olympics held by Germany and to kind of seat Blackness in the atrium alongside these other histories and declare um, victories, not only uh, you know, that for Jesse Owens, but I think that the German public was very, very excited to see this um, superior Olympiad, this Olympian. And, and so the, the, the piece was a series of sculptures that paid tribute to Jesse Owens in, in the Black South Side. And it's, quotidian state, if you will. And uh, Okwi was also somehow involved in, in another exhibition, so, or anyway, came to speak about one of your exhibitions in Milan, which was another collection show, let's say, uh, that you presented at the Fondazione Prada. And uh, there was an evolution of a, another show that you had at the Kunstmuseum in Basel. Um, I want to ask you two separate questions. One, uh, you had on the occasion of the show in Milan, a conversation with Okwi, a public conversation with Okwi, uh, with Spike Lee and uh, with Dean Reese. And uh, that must have been one of the last actually public appearances of, of Okwi. And one that was uh, somewhat contemporaneous with his preparation on grief and grievance. So I want to ask you what the subject of that public conversation was. Um, and uh, and even if you remember of, of any conversations around the show at the time, yeah. Well, if we can we can see if there's an image, Derek, of of uh, um, that conversation between the four of us. Uh, I remember quite a few things. Uh, thank you. So this is from Kunstmuseum Basel, uh, the install of um, my cabinet for Black Madonna, which is a series of about thirty five hundred images. Um, from the Johnson Publishing Collection that I used to create a kind of minor archive of 20,000 images that I had purchased the rights to use um, uh, from Johnson Publishing in advance of it being, uh, the images being sold to the, to the Getty um, by a consortium. So this, this work was very important to me and Oakwe had been a very um, ardent, believer in African uh, photography and had been an advisor to many on the subject of um, the image uh, in addition to his reflections on Derrida's uh, archive fever with his own book. And so I think that here the black image and the archive became very important uh, cross currents for Okwi and I and um, and for Fondazione Prada, we decided that we would um, uh, talk about these images. I had a small uh, selection of, of the images uh, at their space. And, and I thought Spike Lee, in conversation with D. Rees, who he had uh, uh, taught at one point, but D. Rees, for me, is one of the key uh, young intellectuals around image making filmmaking, image production, uh, the black image. And it was my first time meeting uh, D. Rees uh, there, there in Milan. And so we were able to, the four of us, 
then kind of reflect on the black image and then talk about film and really be just casual with one another about, um, with an interlocutor about you know, the future of the black image, the ways in which these images circulate, how should they circulate? Are they better um, on the newsstand through a corporation or are they better in a museum or a formal archive? Do they stop living? Can they still live? And so and so. And so um, I think that in this sense, Okwe and I were just starting to scratch the surface of the, of the conversation of, of the image. You mentioned Okwe's interest in, in the idea of the archive to which he dedicated a, an important show at the International Center for Photography. And um, I wanna ask you, first of all, if by any chance you saw that show, you were aware of that show. I was and, aware of it. Yeah. And if and how his ideas around the archive shaped uh, your work. I mean, obviously when, when Okwe was thinking of the archive, he was thinking also of the prescriptive role of archives uh, when it comes to race, when it comes to subjectivity. Um, I don't think, it, well, the, the, the show was called Archive Fever. I don't think it was, or, or I might be misremembering. Um, I don't recall if he was also interested in what is lost in the archive, which is, you know, notoriously one of the arguments of Saidia Hartman in, in many of her books, you know, what doesn't make it to the archive because it was not deemed important and um, which is clearly also something that, that you work on, no? Yes, I mean, I, 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 it, it feels very important to say that if you look at Derrida's reflections on the archive, you know, it, it feels like Derrida is trying to lay out a foundation around how power preserves itself. And, and I think that what uh, Sadia Hardman and Okwe in very different ways were trying to articulate is that um, if, if we already know the truth of that power, then how do we create our own uh, logics of knowledge preservation, of knowledge transference, not for the sake sake of power for in a police state, but for the sake of like soul, like a memory that's necessary to do the work to remain strong as a people, mm -hmm. or to do the work to become strong as a people. And so I think that in that sense, um, uh, I I know that I am not a formal archivist. The thing that I'm invested in is understanding that uh, the form that archiving as a, as a practice and a form offers us access to strengthening possibilities within a nation. And so I'm constantly telling people, ask your auntie, ask your grandma for her things, ask your dad for his things, ask your grandfather and keep those things and even if a museum isn't interested in them, it is our job to hold our things close because in some cases, it's the things that help jar our memory to the truth of the existence of a past. And in the event that we can't have physical things, record yourselves, record, uh, you know, record your, your parents every day, you know, record your brothers and sisters, record our songs that are informal, record the dances, and I think that I'm invested in, in, in this way. You know, there is a book that I often quote uh, and it is very, very germane to this topic, which is Regis Debray, The Life and Death of Images. And, mm -hmm. and he says that art is born funerary. You know, the, the, the very first expression of art is opposing the horizontality of the corpse, uh, sorry, jolly stuff for the afternoon, <laughs> with the verticality of the stele. And you know, that all sculpture and all art is actually an attempt to both commemorate and fight that disappearance. And, and he goes further by saying that only humans take pictures of things because they know they're losing them. And, um, and I think you know, part of that energy is very present in, in your work. I wanna ask you a couple of questions about your most recent show um, and then maybe open up the, the floor to the audience and to, to questions. And uh, your show at Gagosian of which we can see some images on one end continue this uh, archival impulse and, and on the other also um, occurred in the middle of the pandemic. It was open with all the, the crazy, 
restrictions that we come accustomed to and uh, um, and it was a, a very powerful show, this room in particular, which was lined with bricks. Um, so you want to tell us a little more about this project and also what it meant for you to open it in that time and, and what were the challenges also of opening it and keeping it open? And was mm -hmm. it planned for earlier or, or for? Yes, so the, the exhibition definitely uh, was about uh, eight months to a year behind a, a schedule. Uh, previously scheduled, which worked very well for me. Um, I was at the American Academy in Rome preparing for the exhibition and then uh, had to come back to the States because of um, the announcement of this new new virus that, that, that uh, at that time didn't quite have a name. It was on its way to being named COVID-19. Um, for me, the Gagosian show feels important because it allowed me to kind of continue a work that seemed like it had started largely in Europe and maybe that the, uh, that the US didn't have access to. I wanted to bring um, walking prayer um, to the United States um, because it really is a kind of long prayer poem um, that deals with um, uh, the idea of the Madonna but also maybe the Madonna's relationship to uh, women, largely black women, particularly my mom, uh, even more specifically. And, and so this this is a kind of prayer, a prayer of to the women, to the woman. And um, and I think the way it is, the books are quite delicate. They're they're all. Um, rebound books of the black canon and their titles are sometimes embedded in the new spine details or the spine is a response uh it's a stanza based response to the contents of the book and so what i've done is uh over two and a half years uh created this long poem that becomes a kind of bibliography of the black literary uh, field. Mm -hmm. um, and tools are yeah. lined with bricks uh, that are created for this installation or? Yes. And then I was able to work again with the brick company uh, that helped me um, with the Walker exhibition to create a kind of sanctuary, if you will, and to kind of convert the Gagosian space from a white walled gallery to a kind of, anyway, an attempt at a different architectural alternative, you know, mm -hmm. so that these two works, which were both um, information based, one is Johnson Publishing's periodicals that I got from Johnson Publishing and from Linda Johnson Rice, and the other is a kind of black bibliography, uh, that these two works would then be couched with a sound piece called Chorus, which is a reflection on uh, William Pope L's piece chorus that was uh, a year earlier at the, uh, at the Whitney, um, that I wanted to create a somewhat sacred zone that would bring my investment in architecture and archive making into the gallery space. Um, and since this was my first exhibition with Gagosian, I thought um, I also wanted to establish a kind of um, uh, working basis for the way that I'd like to be engaged with the gallery and the way that I wanted to have my first exhibition in New York. And so it was maybe a little bit more ambitious than um, any you know other things I'd done in the past, but it felt really good. And I felt now, I feel now like I, I think I know how to handle space better. And, and I was really thankful to Gagosian for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Tias. And I think if you agree, we'll, we'll hear from the audience. And there is a question about the Black Madonnas, if you were inspired by Black Madonnas in Spain or, or elsewhere, or was it based on a Black Madonna in, in Switzerland itself? Or the, the, the Madonna that I have at Kunstmuseum Basel is the Spanish Black Madonna. Mm -hmm. But while I was in, uh, uh, in Switzerland, I went to Einsiden, 
I think is how you pronounce it or something like that, where they have a, an extremely beautiful uh, Madonna. And I wanted to kind of uh, pay homage to them both. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, the Madonna that was in that exhibition was also uh, made from a keychain that was a gift to me and had been in uh, the purse for many years. And the, the, arm, it, the, the arm, the hand was broken off. And so the Madonna had been used to help find people's keys for a long time. And she was blessing, blessing, blessing. And I thought this keychain could be a really beautiful uh, um, testament. Uh, 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 an object of prayer and uh, yeah and, and so and the object so itself it's, uh, what is it made of the sculpture it's uh it's bronze and, and it was blown up uh, into foam and then recasted so that if you would if you look closely at her features they're not precise mm -hmm. because they were taken from such a small uh, a keychain maybe this size you know and uh, I really like that there is a question about the, the library you created in Chicago and how and if it relates to, to the last show at Gagosian. Yes. So um, at home, uh, and, and this may be a kind of compensation tactic, Mas, that, that um, because I didn't pursue a PhD, there was a kind of ongoing hunger to like know things and read things. Um, and, you know, I often say that both my mom and my dad, they were like, look, uh, if you're gonna be a worker, you should have your own tools. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, books in this case are a big, a big tool in my, in my tool belt. Um, the books that I have in Chicago at the Stony Island Arts Bank, that was a gift from Linda Johnson Rice to me, a personal gift um, of the entire library of Johnson Publishing Company. And it's a, it's a gift that I will probably gift either to Rebuild Foundation or in the future, it'll be something that I have to think more seriously about. But that library um, in a way uh, gave me an opportunity to dig deeper into my own interest in architecture, but also trying to think about what's my relationship? Can the studio do something that is also public so that you know, Rebuild and the Arts Bank was an attempt at making the studio practice public and having enough infrastructure where we could do bigger things than I could afford to do and bigger things than I had time to do by myself from the studio directly. And so yeah. it, in a way, its mission is to kind of think about art and archives, but um, its, its birth was really birthed out of the impulse that the studio has to be more social. Uh, there is a question about actually the way in which communities engage with your work in Chicago. And I think you touch upon it. And I want to ask a question myself. You know, it, there is obviously a, a great talent also in, in organization, which you mentioned you learned when you were working in Chicago. Um, and you know, even on, on overcoming or producing bureaucracy that, that has different results. I wanna ask you, what do you think, and this might be a brutal simplistic question, uh, what is the difference between the work that you were doing when you were involved in city planning or city management and the work of the artist? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Mas, maybe in many ways, uh, the work of the city and the, and let's say the work of having my pottery studio for 12 years at a small pottery place called Lill Street in Chicago, that it felt like the, the learning of bureaucracy and the learning of um, studio practices were still postgraduate learning. Mm -hmm. that, that, that I think, uh, what's the difference between me being an administrator and then choosing to do my own thing, it was experience that, 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 that in some ways um, I wouldn't create a dichotomy between being a bureaucrat and being an artist. It just happened that in my life, there was a progression. And in that progression, I learned things about how cities are governed that ultimately helped 
my, my future knowledge as an artist, you know? Mm. So I could, I could dream about different kinds of projects with cities, with governments, I could negotiate differently. I, I, I knew where pockets of money lived and I could give that advice to others, you know? But I think that the other part of the question of like, you know, kind of questions of impact in the community and, and what does the work mean? I actually think based on my knowledge of how cities work, that it's actually too early to have a real criticism of myself or a critique of what the work is. Give it 50 years. Mm -hmm. But I'm in the, you know, if Rebuild was conceived of in 2010, can I be proud of the fact that we've been able to secure a couple buildings and make some exhibitions? Absolutely. You know, we've been able to advance artists' careers and amplify that. That's amazing. But I think that there's a, a bigger work that I may not even see in my lifetime about what it means for artists to invest deeply in the place where they live and actually mean it, you know? And I feel like there are great examples of that. I'm thinking about Boetti's, Boetti's uh, commitment to his practice and kind of like, you know, finding a place outside of, 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 of Rome and saying, you know, I think I wanna build a place where my serial works can live for a long time. Mm -hmm. Boetti's, in, uh, his invention is different from Warhol's invention, you know, of, of you know, what, what should happen next. And so I think that in some ways, I'm at the very, very beginning of an investigation of black space that ultimately for me, I hope will have significant benefit for future artists. What it'll look like in the next 10, 20 years, it doesn't really matter to me because <laughs> I think that the arc of time for city change and for revolutionary change is broader than our lifetimes. Well, I think that's a, a, a great place to end. And uh, there are more questions coming in, but I think you, you have addressed many of them. And uh, unless there is anything else you wanna add, we'll thank you. And uh, thank you twice as uh, warmly for being with us twice in a month and twice in eight days. And uh, we hope to see you in person soon and to see you at the exhibition when you can. Thank awesome. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Out there. Thank you.